Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Um, inshallah, uh, we'll, we'll be doing the Eid Salah and I'll explain how I'm going to be leading it. Uh, before I do very briefly, uh, my name is Aris Salim. I serve as a chaplain at the University of Illinois Chicago and Shadia and the, uh, and the folks on the board invited me to come and, and deliver the khutbah. So I'm really happy to be here and I look forward to meeting you all inshallah once once uh, we, we commence or complete inshallah the prayer. So um, today, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. Billah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati amalina. Man yahdihi allahu falamu billala wa man yudlilhu falaha adiyala. Wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Amma ba'd, qala allahu ta'ala fi kitabihi al-majid ba'da a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. We begin with the praise of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Lord of the Worlds. We send our choicest peace and blessings on our blessed Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, his family, his companions, and all those that follow him with sincerity until the day of judgment. Um, I want to begin by saying that I'm very grateful once again to be here uh, to share this space with you all. Um, I, want to, I want to highlight what Muslim space um, seems to be to me from a distance is a place of expansiveness, uh, a place of welcome, a place of inclusivity. And I feel where there is this welcome and inclusivity and expansiveness, it's very closely tied to the notion of mercy because mercy often gives us a feeling of expansiveness. And where there's cruelty or coldness, it gives us a sense of um, deep or constriction. So I think this is a great sign uh, of the community you're building here, and which is one of the reasons why I accepted the invitation to be here with you all. Um, with that said, I wanted to start the khutbah by reflecting on the meaning of Eid, on the meaning of this joyous occasion, Eid al-Fitr. Um, and there's many ways that we can look upon this. There are many layers to the meanings, and then you can also look at it in different ways or different meanings. So I want to offer you some of that um, for, this, for this first piece here. So first and foremost, Eid is a celebration of divine mercy, of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us, um, it is an appreciation or a time to appreciate the countless blessings that he uh, has given us. Um, and it is a celebration in particular of his mercy in having guided us to the path of Islam um, and to have taught us what we knew not, what we knew not. As Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Ikra wa rabbuk al-akram, read or recite and your Lord is most generous. The one who taught by the pen, by the pen. And he taught humanity what it knew not or what they knew not. This what they knew not, I'm stressing it because there are many ways as human beings we can gain knowledge and come to know. Um, whether it's through our senses or through our reason. But there's a special kind of knowledge through divine communication to be taught what we didn't know before, to be inspired, and in particular for the Prophet وسلم, to be inspired by God himself with the goal of reaching us humanity and teaching us through the book and purifying us through the book, through the Quran. This in itself is a big mercy and guidance and trying to be appreciative of that because not everyone has a path. Not everyone has a path laid out for them to walk on to attain closeness to God. That we have it is a great blessing. And today is a day to celebrate the mercy of being guided on this path. Um, there's also no doubt a connection 
between Ramadan, the month of fasting, and Eid al-Fitr, right? There's no doubt about that. And we've heard many times about this relationship. But what I kind of want to uh, reflect with you all today on is a couple of verses that caught my in particular um, that I noticed the connection between. And I thought this sort of ties in very well with the kind of mercy we celebrate or the divine mercy we celebrate today, the quality, the intensity of it. So the first verse that I want to uh, bring to your attention is one that we have probably heard during the course of the month of Ramadan, which is the verse in which God prescribes fasting, um, where Allah Ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum usiyama kama kutiba ala ladina min qadrikum la'allakum tattakum. Fasting has been written for you, kutiba, prescribed or mandated for you, as it was prescribed to those before you, so that you may become God conscious or God aware. What I want to highlight in this verse today, with regards to my point, is that verb, kutiba, which goes back to the root word in Arabic, to write, literally to write. But here the meaning in the, here, the meaning is being used slightly differently in that it's prescription or being mandated upon us. Um, but we can appreciate the, the word writing itself because when you move from speech to writing, there's something official that happens, right? It's being transcribed, it's being put down and signed, sealed, and done. So there is a gravity to this word writing itself, right? But here it's being used in the sense that God has mandated it it upon us. He's written it upon us. Okay. Um, let's hold that there for a second. Now I want to take you to the second verse in the Quran that I've, I, I, I draw a connection between, where Allah Ta'ala uses the same verb, but in a different con context. This is in Surah Al-An'am, where Allah says, كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةً كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةً He writes Upon himself, mercy. He prescribes or mandates upon his very self. This is God speaking. Your Lord prescribes upon his very self, mercy. And it's the same word that's being used, right? The same root, kataba, to write. And it's also being used in that same linguistic sense. Not literally, but in the sense of being written. He is imposing it upon himself as a duty to be merciful just as he is imposing upon us to fast as a duty during the month of this Ramadan, uh, during the month of fasting. But the connection that I feel this brings us to, or the kind of beautiful thought that this really brings us to, is that just as we fasted during this month of Ramadan, just as we were prescribed to fast during this month of Ramadan, there is a relationship on the side of God, you could say, or the end of God, where he mandated upon himself to be merciful in response to us. So as we were fasting for his sake, as we were depriving ourselves from our basic necessities, food, drink, intimacy, for God and God alone in the heart of our hearts, the light of his mercy was constantly shining upon us, constantly interacting upon us in this kind of covenantal bond where he has covenanted with us that we fast, and he has covenanted with himself mercy upon us. This is the mercy, the boundless mercy and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are celebrating today, that we are grateful for today. Um, another point of reflection that I'd like to offer you all in today's khutbah, um, in regards to the meaning of the joy in this day, the joy that is imbued and, and, and felt during this day is there's a way to look at how the sacrifice and efforts of fasting um, is followed by this day of celebration and joy and coming together as a mirror of the life to come and the relationship between the life of this world, the dunya, and what we're meant to do here and the next life. Right? We struggle and we strive and we sacrifice and we send our good deeds ahead so that they can meet us in the next life. And in the next life, we experience some kind of joy and, and, and delight in being in the presence of God and the people of God in Jannah, in heaven. And so to that end, you could think of Eid as a small reflection 
of the joy that we will experience in paradise, inshallah. And to that end, I want to take us to the Quran to look at some of the descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has um, given of Jannah to try to bring that to life. What is some of that imagery? So this is in Surah Al-Mutafifin. Allah Ta'ala says, Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. Surely the virtuous, the virtuous are in na'im. They're in bliss. They're in joy. They're in delight. They're in a state of delight. Ala al-ara'iki yandurun. They're upon couches or thrones, seated, gazing. They are gazing. Ta'arifu fi wujuhihim nadrat al-na'im. You will know or you will recognize in their faces a radiating joy, a radiating joy. So when you look upon their faces, you will see this joy radiating from them. Um, they will be satiated with a drink, right? With a sealed wine that's pure. They will be satiated with a sealed wine that's pure. Uh, excuse me. The last sip of it will smell like musk. The last sip of that drink or the last of it will smell like musk or will be musk. So towards that, let those who want to strive, strive, or 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 um, let those who strive, strive diligently. For this experience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing before us. And it continues, the verses continue. And its taste is from tasneem. And then it goes on to say, what is tasneem? Tasneem is aynayn yashrabu bihal muqarrabun. So its taste is from this fountain. This fountain from which the close people to God drink from. So the close ones to God drink from this fountain. And it is from that, that that taste, that last taste, which you drink in Jannah is going to smell of musk. Similarly, in Surah Al-Ghashiyah, Allah Ta'ala talks about faces that are radiant with joy. Again, wujuhi yawma na'ima. And we recited that in the Salah as well. Faces on that day will be glowing in joy, content with their striving and efforts. Lisa'iha um, radiya. Whatever they put forward, they will now see it and feel it and feel joy about it and feel pleased with what they put ahead. Fi jannatin aliyah, in a garden that is elevated. Fi jannatin aliyah, la tasma'u fiha laliyah. And they will not hear in it vain talk. They will not hear in it, but only holistic and beautiful speech is what will touch them. Fiha um, aynun jariyah, and in it will be a spring that is continuously flowing. That is continuously flowing. Um, in it will be raised couches or seating and cups that are placed before you and cushions that have been lined up and carpets that have been spread out. So it's this glorious welcome, this glorious welcome home. All of this beautiful, beautiful imagery that Allah Ta'ala is exposing to us or God is sharing with us, today can be a day where we recall these images to mind and see the joy of paradise in each other's faces. When we greet each other, when we hug each other on this day, that we see a small reflection of that joy. Um, that when we eat and drink from the drinks that people serve us so that we serve each other, we remember the taste of this beautiful, the taste of this kind of pure wine that's sealed or the food that is uh, pleasurable beyond words that we serve each other through this. Um, and that we just see a small imprint of that radiance on the faces and the smiles of our family members and our community members. Um, the other way that I, I believe that Jannah is described in the Quran is in Surah Al-Fajr, and this comes at it from a slightly different angle. And I think this will be the last one, last example I give before shifting to the second khutbah. Uh, in Surah Al-Fajr, um, we find paradise described in a different angle. We find instead what's highlighted is the state in which we arrive. The state in which we arrive. So Allah says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. O serene soul. O serene soul or soul at rest. 
Return to your Lord. Return to your Lord. Content with God and God being content with it, with the soul that's returning. Then it goes on to say, uh, So enter with my servants and enter my garden. What I want to point out to here, not only is this beautiful imagery about how we arrive in paradise in a state of tranquility, um, returning to our nourishing sustainer, content, this mutual contentment between God and the soul, um, but also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the servants before he mentions the garden. He says, So enter with my servants and enter my garden and enter my garden. And this, I believe, suggests that Jannah is not just an individual affair of just acquiring maximum, maximum utilitarian pleasure in the afterlife, but it is a communal affair that what makes Jannah Jannah is also who we arrive with, who we arrive with, with the Prophet And this is stressed in another place as well, in Surah Al-Inshifa. And as for those who is given, as for the one who is given their book in their right hand, they'll be, theirs will be an easy accounting or an easy reckoning. And they will return to their people in happiness and joy. And they will return, that person that's handed their book in their right hand will return to their people, whoever their people are, masrura, in joy and happiness. So indeed, paradise is also, and Jannah is also about arriving with our beloveds back to this abode. And what I wanted to, to highlight about this, or the reason I brought this communal dimension, is that today is a day where we come together as a community, as a spiritual family, where we, we show each other love. And this too is a reflection of our experience in paradise and uh, a time to be grateful for what we sent ahead in Ramadan, whatever those sincere efforts uh, may have been or whatever that worship looked like for you in that month. I will try to keep this second khutbah shorter. It was shorter in my head. I'm sorry. Um, but I think this, these might be some helpful things to recall. Um, one thing I want to bring to mind is that in as much as today is a day of joy for all of us, we are still in this life. And in this life, we know the nature of this life is struggle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal insanu, Ya ayyuhal insana, inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaki. Which translates as, O oh, humanity, surely you are, you are struggling, you are toiling intensely towards your Lord. Then you meet him. Then you meet him. And this ultimately is the reality of this life. So we may ask ourselves, on this day of Eid, on this day that it's supposed to be filled with joy, what of Eid when I have no community? What of Eid when I have no friends or family members to celebrate it with? What of the joy that I spoke of in the first football? What of Eid if I'm dying? What of Eid if I have a chronic illness? If I have that awareness and yet Eid is falling, where is that joy that I am calling us towards? Or perhaps my Eid is spent caring for someone that is soon to leave this world. Perhaps I've spent most of Ramadan focused on that. What of Eid then? Or perhaps this is going to be the first Eid where someone that was very close to be part of this world and this is the first Eid and I deeply miss their presence and deeply feel their absence and deeply feel the grief around that. Where is the joy in this experience? Or maybe I felt disconnected this Ramadan because I could fast. I could not fast with the community because of an illness I have or some health issues I have. Or there were some certain kinds of worship that I wasn't able to engage as I saw other community members engaging. 
where is the joy of these efforts that I'm speaking about? It starts to feel a bit idealistic. In addressing this tension that I'm kind of bringing to mind or bringing to the fore, I want to lift up a hadith or a narration of the Prophet on what he did as a sunnah or as a habit on Eid. So it's been narrated to us that on the day of Eid in particular, when he would go to Eid prayer, he would return in a different road or a different path. So he would not return the way that he went, right? And the commentator, one of the commentators says that there may have been different kinds of reasons for this. One of them being that he wanted to greet people, you know, in both streets or along in circle. So he met the maximum amount of people spreading peace. The other uh, thing that he mentioned was that he also wanted to fulfill the needs of the people along the path. He wanted to fulfill the different needs of the people along the path, so he took a different route so that he could fulfill the needs of the people in that circuit. Um, but what do we really see underlying this example in relation to what I've shared? Is that the Prophet ﷺ radiated his joy outwards. He radiated it. And he encircled his community with it, making sure the joy and shukr and the gratefulness that he felt in his heart was also felt by others, to making sure that it was touched and experienced by others. So returning to this idea of the grief and the challenges and the struggles that don't disappear on Eid, let's reflect on how we, from if we are in a position where we have this family, where we have this network, where we have this joy in our hearts on Eid, let's reflect deeply on how can we radiate it in the way the Prophet has taught us. How can we make sure it reaches, especially those who might need it today? How can we make sure of that? Can we relieve someone's difficulty today, someone's burden today, or make something easier for them? Maybe take up a, a task for them so they could go out and enjoy Eid if they haven't. Um, can we invite someone to our home that we haven't yet? Someone that we feel may need a friend or may need some welcoming. Can we give to someone in need today? Can we give a charity today to relieve someone's difficulty? Um, can we do something extraordinary, extraordinarily special for our families individually to show them how special they are to us on this day? Something above and beyond us, uh, a real a gesture that, that can, they can actually feel that, wow, Dad's acting different today. Mom's acting different today. This is something really special. They really want us to feel it. In a, in a sentence, I'm asking us all to spread the taste of paradise today for those who may not be experiencing it. If you, on the other hand, yourself, are feeling like your cup is not full on this day, or that you find yourself in some of the situations that I've described, then let me remind you of something. The Prophet ﷺ also held Eid in times of grief and loss for him. There were constantly battles, there was constantly wars in his lifetime, but Eid was still held in the midst of it. What does that mean for that community and for the Prophet? That means that his heart, as sensitive as it was, was aware of that person that sacrificed his life and was no longer there, of the widows in the crowd on that Eid. It was very real for them. Grief did not disappear on Eid. Challenges and trials did not disappear on Eid. Our Eid too is filled with these kinds of complications and challenges. Some of those we may voice or we may not, but we have them. Maybe they're long-term issues, each of us in our own way. But I want to invite us to reflect on the fact that this does not take away the meaning of joy and Eid for us if we look at it from a certain angle. What beautiful joy is the kind of joy that combines a sense of gratefulness that is cognizant to the blessings that we do enjoy, however little or difficult they may be, to, may be right now to be able to fully see them? How beautiful is that joy that can acknowledge those blessings and have that gratefulness in the heart and at the same time acknowledge the struggles on the path that God has placed before you? How beautiful is that joy? That is the kind of joy rooted in shukr, rooted in gratefulness, that does not ignore the challenge, the struggles, that doesn't try to brush our true emotions under the carpet on this day, but it holds both in a beautiful tension. I have things, 
and I recognize the difficulty I'm facing right now. And I hold them both gently. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all the to do that, especially if you're in or what is what the reward is rooted in. And that is what we can be proud of. This is what I'd like to say to you all. Eid Mubarak, Barakallah Fikum. Thank you so much for allowing. إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعا وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابا Allah we ask you for your blessings on this joyous occasion of Eid we ask you to fill our hearts with the joy of paradise we ask you to give us tawfiq to greet each other in love and peace we ask you to forgive our sins and shortcomings and accept from us all of our deeds all of our intentionality towards you during the month of fasting we ask you to forgive our parents forgive our forefathers and those that have come before us we ask you to forgive us for our sins we ask you to forgive our um, family members and friends and that you help them with their difficulties we ask you to guide our children guide this community oh Allah we ask you to empower us to serve one another, to fulfill your call for justice on this earth, to do the best we can to serve you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you to fill our hearts with shukr for you and thanks for you and praise for you on this day. Bi rahmatika, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ameen.